welcome to the latest in the series of Art Unlocked online talks brought to you by Art UK in collaboration with Bloomberg Philanthropies. I'm Victoria Osborne, I'm Curator of Fine Art and Curatorial Team Leader for Birmingham Museums Trust and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to join you today to share just a few of the highlights of Birmingham's art collection. Birmingham Museums Trust is one of the largest museum trusts in the UK. It's an independent charity created in 2012 to manage the museum collections of the City of Birmingham across nine sites, one of which is Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, which you can see on, on the slide here on a beautiful summer's day. The collection is vast and wide ranging. It numbers around a million objects in total, and those range across art and design, history, archaeology, anthropology, natural science and science and industry. The Western art collection, which is what I'll be focusing on in my talk today, spans around 800 years from a medieval ivory carving to contemporary digital works. And our collections continue to grow and develop today through gift, bequest and purchase. So for my talk today, I've selected six pieces to speak about. It was quite difficult to choose just six, but what I've tried to do is represent the amazing range and variety of the art collection that we have in Birmingham. So I'm hoping that whatever your tastes and whatever your interests, there will be something in this talk that you will enjoy. So this is the first picture that I'm going to talk about today. It's the earliest work in my talk and it's also the tiniest. This is a very small painting. It's only about 11 centimetres high, so it's smaller than a postcard. It really will sit just in the palm of your hand. And this is a painting that was made in Bruges in about 1450 by the Netherlandish painter Petrus Christus. And it's a painting that was made as a focus for private prayer and meditation. You can see here there are two angels pulling back uh, curtains to reveal the figure of Christ. And he's standing up to his waist in water or up to his hips in water, which is quite difficult to see in the image. But he's standing in water to represent the waters of baptism and new life. And he's displaying the wounds of his crucifixion, the marks of the nails in the palms of his hand and the mark of the spear in his side there. And he's looking out very directly at us, the viewer, making this very direct appeal to us. And if you imagine yourself as the person using this as a focus of prayer in the 15th century, it sets up a very direct, very intimate relationship between Jesus and that person who is praying. And that's very deliberate. These kind of works were intended to create a real sense of personal connection and personal responsibility in the person who was praying, to encourage them to focus on their sins, to really meditate on the state of their own soul, and to be urged to repentance by meditating on the sufferings of Christ um, at the crucifixion. This idea is underlined by the figures of the angels. You can see that the one on the right is carrying a sword and the one on the left is carrying lilies. And these are symbols that are associated with the last judgment. So there's the idea of the sword of justice and the lilies of mercy. And so it all underscores this idea of really meditating on the fate of your soul and um, thinking about repentance for your sins in order to think about what will happen to your soul after death. And just as the figure of Christ looks out very directly towards us, so does the figure of the angel on the right who fixes us with this very direct um, look, this very significant look. And it's all about creating that sense of personal connection. If we move on to the next slide, please. The Petrus Christus painting was um, made possible as an acquisition for Birmingham by the generosity of this man, John Feeney, who was a Birmingham newspaper proprietor and philanthropist. And Feeney was a really important figure, an important benefactor for Birmingham, particularly in the early years of the museum, but, but continuing to today, really. So Feeney um, gave a very large collection of Middle Eastern and Far Eastern decorative art to the museum in the uh, 1880s. Uh, he also gave a very substantial amount of money which enabled the building of a whole wing of new galleries for the museum. And he also, thanks to his financial gifts, made possible the acquisition of works for the collection like the Petrus Christus painting that we've seen. Now the John Feeney Charitable Trust actually still exists today in Birmingham and it supports lots of causes locally around particularly art and heritage and public spaces like public parks. So it's still a real um, source, a real force for good um, in the city. 
And just within the last few years, in 2018, the Feeney Charitable Trust, together with another Birmingham charity called the Birmingham Common Good Trust, Common Good Trust uh, funded the creation of a new frame for the Petrus Christus painting. And if we look at the next slide, I can show you what that frame uh, looks like. So you can see on the left, this is a frame that was made for the picture by Peter Sharder, who is head of frame at the National Gallery in London. And I'm showing you this partly to show the really beautiful cast bronze moulding that, that Peter made for the, for the painting, but also because I think it's only when you see the picture uh, to scale, as it were, when you see it with Peter's hand on the right hand side here, you get a sense of just how tiny and exquisite and jewel like this little painting is. And you really get a sense of, of how intimate an experience it is to look at this picture and to, to make eye contact with the figure of, of Christ in this image. And it really brings home, I, I think, the power of this little picture as a devotional work. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Then we'll move on into the 17th century. Birmingham is very fortunate in having a really extraordinary collection of 17th century art with a particular strength in the Italian Baroque. And this is a collection which was built up through a very deliberate process of uh, collecting in the years following the Second World War. Um, really up until the mid 1940s, Birmingham's collection was very weak in European painting with the, the Petrus Christus, which was acquired in 1935, being uh, an honorable exception to that. And so the director and the curator of the museum in the mid 1940s decided essentially to try and build a collection of 17th century European painting from scratch, which was a very ambitious thing for a regional museum to do. And this picture was actually the first painting acquired under that new collecting initiative. It's by Orazio Gentileschi, one of the leading painters of the Italian Baroque. And it was bought for the museum at auction in 1947 for 500 guineas, which is the equivalent of about 20,000 pounds today, though you wouldn't be able to acquire this picture for 20,000 uh, pounds if you tried to buy it at auction now. So Gentileschi was, uh, as I say, one of the most important painters of the Italian Baroque. And this picture remains one of the most significant pictures in Birmingham's collection. And it also has a national significance because until the National Gallery bought its own painting by Gentileschi, The Finding of Moses in 2020, this was actually the only picture by this artist in a UK public collection. So it's really important in, in uh, that way too. So Gentileschi was, painting who, was a painter who spent much of his early career in Rome where he was very strongly influenced by Caravaggio and there's a kind of earthy realism to Gentileschi's early paintings which owes a lot to Caravaggio but Gentileschi also has a kind of elegance and refinement of his own which comes out in particular in his compositions which as you can see with this one it's very spare it's very elegant it's very carefully balanced and he also has this really beautiful colour sense which you can see for example in the lovely uh, lilacs and blues of the drapery of the Virgin Mary on the right of the picture here and the warm brick reds and oranges in the draperies and skin tones of Joseph sleeping on the left hand side. Um, so this is a picture which um, Gentileschi made when he was in Rome in around 1620 and uh, it was just before he left Rome for Genoa and then Paris and he finally ended up in London, where he became principal court painter to Charles I and Queen Henrietta Maria. And this is a picture which was a very successful composition, a very popular composition for Gentileschi. And he and his studio actually often repeated compositions that were popular with his clients and with his public. And this is a picture that actually exists in four different versions, but uh, ours in Birmingham is the earliest painted in, uh, in Rome, and it's the only one that has the wonderful head of the donkey in the background, this lovely kind of shaggy, beautifully observed donkey observing the scene. So the subject of this picture is um, the rest on the flight into Egypt, which derives from the New Testament, and it shows Mary and Joseph and the child Jesus escaping from Judea into Egypt in response to the threats to kill the child uh, from King Herod, who saw the coming of the child Jesus as a threat to his own throne. So Joseph was warned of a danger in a dream, and he and Mary and Jesus packed up and, and escaped to safety in Egypt. 
And Gentileschi's depiction of this subject very much emphasizes the humanity and the vulnerability of the Holy Family at this moment in the story. He shows them essentially as fugitives, as refugees. And you can see that Joseph is lying exhausted there on the left hand side, and he's using um, their sack of belongings as a kind of makeshift bolster. And then you have the figure of Mary feeding the child Jesus at her breast on the right hand side. And there's a lovely kind of humanity and tenderness about the way that Gentileschi shows the mother and child here, um, even in this, this kind of moment of um, or threat to them as, as Mary sits on the bare ground uh, cradling the child to her and he looks out at us with this rather wary glance. Um, so there's this real sense of humanity and it's about the Holy Family as, as divine figures but also very much as real people as well. So for the next painting we're going to stay in the 17th century but move to northern Europe and um, we're going to look at a Flemish picture next. And you might be wondering why I have picked a picture which has very obvious condition issues, um, and which is really, as you can see from this picture here, in quite poor condition. And I've chosen this very de deliberately because one of the amazing things about Art UK as a resource is that when it was first created, it had the aim of capturing all of the nation's oil paintings. It has a much broader remit now, but originally it was all about the nation's oil paintings. And the idea was to make available all paintings in public ownership in the UK. And that was completely regardless of their condition, regardless of quality, regardless of whether they were on display or not. And that was one of the things that made and makes Art UK such an amazing resource because it has that sense of completeness. So for example, if you're researching a particular artist, you can see all the pictures by that artist everywhere in the country in public ownership, regardless of whether they're on display or not. And similarly, you can see works that might be in store because they're just in too poor condition to, to show. And that was the case with this particular picture. And one of the things about Art UK is the fact that it shows pictures in poor condition means that it's sometimes an opportunity for important pictures that may be lurking in store for condition reasons to actually be rediscovered. And some of you may well be familiar with a programme on BBC4 called, called Britain's Lost Masterpieces, which is hosted by Dr Ben Grosvenor and Emma Dabbery, who you can see on the next slide. And one of the things that uh, Ben likes to do and is very, very good at is looking on Art UK to find overlooked masterpieces. And these may be works which have been misattributed or pieces that have been overlooked often because of their, their poor condition. Um, and, you know, you may not immediately see at first glance that there's a really interesting uh, picture waiting to be rediscovered. And I had an email from Bendor uh, towards the end of 2018 asking if he could come to the museum to look at a number of pictures that he'd spotted on Art UK and wanted to have a closer look at, one of which was our Flemish landscape. And if we move on to the next slide. So when Bendor came to visit the museum, we had a look at this picture together under, under torchlight. And it very quickly became clear that there was a really interesting uh, and high quality picture lurking beneath the layers of discoloured varnish, heavy overpaint, um, under the residue of, of tissue that had adhered to the surface of the picture that you can see on the left there. And Bendor felt very strongly that this could be a work by the very important Flemish artist Jan Bruegel the Elder. And a lot of that was based on the fact that even through the, the murk, uh, he could spot that the animals in the picture were really beautifully painted in a way that was very characteristic of Bruegel's work. And you can see particularly the cows on the bottom right hand corner of the picture here. They look rather gloomy here, but, but Bendel could see that these, these cows were worth further investigation. So the picture became a focus of an episode of Britain's Lost Masterpieces. And the painting went for uh, conservation and restoration at Simon Gillespie Studio in London. And we knew that there was potentially something very interesting there underneath, but I think even Bendor couldn't quite have known how amazing the transformation would be. And if we move to the next slide, you can see what did emerge through that process of restoration, this absolutely wonderful, highly detailed, exquisitely painted village landscape. So this picture was indeed, as we'd had it catalogued before, uh, a picture of autumn. It would originally have been one of a set of four, representing the four seasons. And the picture actually focuses on the practice of cider making 
in autumn. So on the extreme left, you have people harvesting the apples and there are actually even little figures up in the trees uh, bringing the apples down. And then as you move across the, com the composition from left to right, you can see the process of making the cider. So there are little characters who are gathering the apples in sacks and putting them onto a cart. Then they're being brought across the landscape to the cider press, which is roughly in the middle underneath the church spire there. And then the finished cider in barrels is being taken away on carts into the distance. And so this, there's this wonderful little um, kind of village in microcosm here uh, in this painting. And um, Bendel, as, as indeed he had suspected, he was able to, um, to prove that this is a work by Jan Bruegel the Elder. And it's actually a collaboration with another artist called uh, Just de Montpe, the Younger. And it was quite common for artists to collaborate in this way, where each would work to their own individual specialism. So uh, de Montpe painted the landscape and Bruegel painted the figures, and they collaborated on many similar works like this. But this was really a, a wonderful rediscovery for our collection. It filled quite a significant gap for us because we have this amazing 17th century collection, but generally it's much stronger in Southern European painting than Northern. So to have this uh, wonderful landscape rediscovered for us was really exciting. And um, it's been a fabulous addition to the collection in Birmingham. So if we move on to the next picture, we're going to move on into the 19th century. And this is a part of the collection, which is probably the best known um, to uh, people who visited Birmingham Museum and who, who know of our art collection. And that's our really wonderful holding of works by the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, their associates and followers. It's the largest collection in the world and arguably the finest. It contains about 3,000 objects and it spans really the whole range of Pre-Raphaelite art and design practice across a whole range of media. So we have lots of work by the, the original Brotherhood, led by Rossetti and Holton Hunt and uh, Millet. Um, but also the subsequent generations of Pre-Raphaelites who, who kind of followed that original brotherhood. And Ben Jones was one of the leading figures in the second generation of Pre-Raphaelites who gathered around Rossetti uh, from the 1850s. And Ben Jones has a particular significance for us in Birmingham because he was born in Birmingham in 1833. And he's really probably the most influential artist to come out of the city. And by the time he painted this work in the late 1880s and early 1890s, he was an, an artist with a national and an international reputation. It was quite difficult to choose a single Pre-Raphaelite work to show today. And I have picked this one because it has a particular Birmingham resonance. This work was actually commissioned by the Corporation of Birmingham for Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery in 1887. So just two years after the museum opened. And Burn Jones responded to this commission by producing an extraordinary and enormous watercolour. It's um, over four metres across, so about 13 feet across. It's huge. It's painted on 10 sheets of the largest watercolour paper that you could buy in the 1880s, laid onto canvas. And for the subject of the watercolour, Burn Jones chose a theme that he'd been exploring with uh, his lifelong friend and collaborator, William Morris. They'd made a, water, uh, made a tapestry of the Star of Bethlehem for their old Oxford College, Exeter College. And Burne Jones decided to repeat this composition as a watercolour for his um, hometown of Birmingham. So the subject is the nativity and the visit of the three kings or three magi to see the child Jesus in the stable at Bethlehem. And the title of the work, The Star of Bethlehem, uh, derives from the light held in the hands of the angel hovering in the centre of the composition there. So the star is effectively represented as this divine light being held by the angel. Then you have the figures of uh, Mary and the child Jesus under the canopy there, Joseph, who's been gathering sticks for the fire, and then the figures of the three magi who approach from the right to the child Jesus, who looks uh, rather uh, kind of anxious and, and overwhelmed, this little uh, naked child on his mother's lap. Burne Jones follows the uh, medieval convention of showing the three kings as of different races. So we have European king, an Asian king, and an African king. And that derives from the traditional iconography of the three kings um, as symbolizing the spread of Christianity through um, the then known world. And the 
the king at the front of the procession has laid his crown on the ground at the feet of the child Jesus. And that is to um, symbolize the idea of earthly power, earthly kingship, ceding to something bigger and more important than itself, to a kind of divine kingship represented by this tiny uh, little child on his mother's lap. So I've mentioned about the large scale of this watercolour and you will perhaps get a sense of it if we look at the next slide which shows Burne Jones in the process of painting the Star of Bethlehem in his garden studio in Fulham uh, in 1890 and he quipped that he travelled as many miles as the three kings when he was painting this work up and down his ladder over a period of about three or four years. So the Star of Bethlehem, until very recently, still was framed in its original Victorian plate glass, which, as you might imagine, for a sheet of glass on that scale, sort of 13 feet across, it was incredibly heavy, incredibly fragile, and also very, very reflective. So it meant that the picture was very difficult to move safely, uh, impossible to move safely, really. But also it meant that the reflections on such a dark picture made it very difficult for visitors to see the wonderful detail and surface of Burne Jones's watercolour. So earlier this year, we launched a public appeal to try and raise the funds to reglaze the Star of Bethlehem. And thanks to the generosity of the Pilgrim Trust and to many private donors and members of the public who gave very generously to our appeal, uh, we were delighted to be able to actually reglaze this watercolour in modern, low reflect, lightweight museum acrylic. So that means that the work will be protected for the future. Uh, it's low reflect, so it'll be much easier for people to see the surface, and it means that visitors, uh, when we uh, bring the picture out to show again, will really be able to see the, the wonderful detail of this amazing work. And if we go on to the next slide, you can actually see paper conservator Louise Vale working on the Star of Bethlehem in the gallery uh, in Birmingham during our closure earlier this year. And I'm showing you this partly to give you a sense of the real scale and amazing wall power that this work has. And what an amazing technical achievement for Burne Jones to work on watercolour at this scale. It's a very technically demanding medium. But also it's to highlight the fact that taking the watercolour out of its frame gave us an opportunity to have a proper conservation examination of this piece, really for the first time in 120 years, 130 years. And so that's given us an opportunity to understand more about the watercolour, how it was made, how it was painted, and also how we can best care for it and protect it in the future. So we're really grateful to everybody who made the recent conservation work on this watercolour possible. So if we move on to the next painting, we're kind of cantering forward in time into the 20th century. And I've chosen this work by Barbara Hepworth to represent our drawings collection, which is extraordinary and very, very rich. Um, so this is a work by Barbara Hepworth, one of the 20th century's leading British artists, uh, sculptor and painter and uh, draftsperson. This is one of a series of around 80 hospital drawings, which Hepworth made over a period of about two years in the late 1940s. And she became interested in the work of surgeons through her friendship with a surgeon called Norman Capener, who was working at the Princess Elizabeth Orthopaedic Hospital in Exeter, where Hepworth's daughter Sarah was undergoing treatment. And Hepworth became friends with Capener, and through him she was able to have access to the surgeons and in fact to the operating uh, theatre to actually watch surgical procedures um, in progress. And she was able to do that by using a specially sterilised notebook and pen. She would go into the operating theatre and she would make notes and little studies, which she would then be able to work up into finished compositions uh, like this one here. And if you have a look on Art UK, you'll find there are other works from the series uh, in other collections that you can also look at uh, in Bristol and Manchester, among others. So it's worth having, having a browse to see more in the series. Now, Hepworth was really interested in the work of the surgeons in the theatre, but she was also really interested in the whole process of preparation before they went to carry out these, these very uh, delicate, very um, involved procedures. And this work called Prelude focuses on that moment of concentration and preparation. You can see that one of the figures uh, in the background is being uh, helped into their uh, surgical gown. Um, they're wearing masks and caps and the figures in the foreground are kind of flexing their hands ready 
uh, for the uh, procedure to come. Because these figures are, are largely shrouded and hidden in their masks and their surgical gowns and their caps, it increases the emphasis on their eyes, these kind of sensitive, um, very, very humane eyes that you can see looking out from behind the masks, and also places greater emphasis on the hands, these very sensitive, uh, flexible, dexterous hands. And in all of Hepworth's surgical drawings, there's a real emphasis on the hands and on the delicacy and precision with which the surgeons uh, manipulate um, their instruments in the process of, of surgery. And this is something that Hepworth as a practicing artist found really interesting. And she drew parallels between the work of the surgeons, the, these very sort of uh, precise and dexterous people. She drew parallels between their work and the work of artists and sculptors like herself. And there was something about that, that very sort of exact movement, that, that care, uh, that kind of rhythmic work that they were doing that, that uh, kind of chimed with her own experience of being an artist. And one of the things I find really interesting about her friendship with Norman Capener was that it was very much a creative exchange. So she became interested in, in surgery uh, and medical practice through him, but he was also really interested in art. So he was a collector, he was a painter, and he also became interested in practicing sculpture through his friendship with Hepworth. And so I find it really interesting that there were all these points of connection and interest that they shared and that it was such a, a fruitful friendship. Um, because of these, these points of connection that they have between them. So we're now going to move on to the last work which I'm going to show you today. And this is actually quite a recent acquisition. So the last piece I'm going to show you is a sculpture that we acquired in 2020 with the help of funding from Art Fund, the v &A Purchase Grant Fund and the Friends of Birmingham Museums. And this is a piece by Hugh Locke, who is one of the world's leading contemporary artists. And um, his work, I'm sure, will be familiar to, to many of you. He's become particularly well known in recent years for some of his large scale commissions. For example, the large installation piece called The Procession, which is on display at Tate Britain. Locke is a Guyanese British artist, and he's particularly interested in He's particularly interested in themes around national myth-making, the kind of stories that nations tell about themselves and the ways in which the legacies of history have a kind of continuing resonance in the present day. And one of the things that he's particularly interested in is sculptures and monuments and the kind of symbolic value and weight that these kind of sculptures and monuments have in our societies. And a figure that he's returned to again and again in his practice is the figure of Queen Victoria. And it's a figure that has a particular personal resonance to Hugh Locke. He spent many of his formative years in Guyana and he went to school in Georgetown. And every day when he went to school, he used to walk past a sculpture of Queen Victoria. And it was one of dozens of sculptures of the monarch that were shipped across the British Empire in the late 19th century to express and consolidate British power in those colonized places. So there are statues of, of Queen Victoria all over the world and she's this really kind of familiar uh, figure. And the statue of Queen Victoria that stood in the uh, centre of Georgetown uh, was actually attacked in an act of anti-colonial protest in 1954. And if we look at the next slide, we can see the aftermath of that attack. The head of the sculpture was blown off and uh, it also lost a hand. It was subsequently restored and it was placed back in its position in the centre of Georgetown. And in the next slide, we can see that it remained there until 1970, when it was removed after Guyana was officially recognised as a republic. And for the next 20 years, it lived in the Botanic Gardens in Georgetown. And that's a place that Hewlett particularly remembers it, remembers seeing it kind of slightly languishing there for 20 years. More recently in 1990, and slightly controversially, the figure of Queen Victoria was returned to its place in the centre of Georgetown. And if if you look at images of it today, you can see that it still bears the scars um, of that dynamite attack in 1954, even though it's, it, it was since restored. Now, over the last 20 years, Hewlock has explored images of Queen Victoria, uh, as well as uh, other public sculptures in his practice, across a range of media, so um, prints, uh, photographs, and um, pieces like the uh, ceramic piece that we've acquired recently for Birmingham. 
And he's been particularly interested in having the opportunity of working with an actual sculpture of Queen Victoria in the public realm. And that became possible for him earlier this year through a commission in Birmingham, which we can see on the next slide. So this is Hulock's Foreign Exchange, which is a reimagining by him of a bronze statue of Queen Victoria, which stands outside the Council House in the centre of Birmingham. It's actually very close to the Museum and Art Gallery. It's just, just around the corner from us. And this is an amazing piece, which Hulock produced as a commission for the Birmingham 2022 Festival for the Commonwealth Games, uh, which was commissioned by uh, Icon Gallery in Birmingham. And you can see the figure in the centre is the bronze um, statue of Queen Victoria, which normally stands alone on its plinth. And Locke has surrounded it with this additional structure of a boat in which there are five small Queen Victorias. And the idea is that this is like a battalion of Victorias who are kind of sailing off uh, across the empire. But the imagery of boats, which Hulot returns to a lot in his work, um, also has all kinds of resonances around trade and migration. These pieces are quite multi-layered. They tend not to have a single, a single meaning, but they have lots of kind of resonances and associations. And these Queen Victoria figures all wear helmets, which are, are reminiscent of the kind of helmets worn by Britannia as the kind of personification of Britain. And it's about thinking about what do these images of Queen Victoria represent and what do they say about the idea of Britishness that was being uh, exported across the empire in the 19th century. And what does it mean for us today uh, when we have these images in our, in our city centres? So having this piece in the centre of Birmingham during the Commonwealth Games felt like something that was really powerful um, and resonant for Birmingham as a city. So if we move back to the next slide, which uh, again shows our piece, Souvenir 9, um, which we bought in 2020. So it was really exciting for us to be able to acquire this piece by such an important and influential contemporary artist. And it's a piece that had a particular interest for us because of the resonances that it has with our own collection in Birmingham. So Birmingham has this, it's a very rich collection in all sorts of ways, but it does have a particular strength in the 19th century. And that's in terms of decorative art as well as fine art. And what Hulot does in his souvenir series is he takes original 19th century ceramic busts of British royalty. They're made of parian ware, which is a white uh, porcelain that mimics marble. Um, these little, little kind of busts. And he dresses them in this kind of extraordinary, very ornate uh, regalia. And so again, you have Queen Victoria as this, this almost sort of Britannia figure, almost this, this kind of warrior queen. And it's very beautifully crafted. It's quite seductive. It, it sparkles in the light. You have the, have the gold, you have the, the reflective surfaces. But you're kind of drawn into this rather seductive object. And then when you look closer, there are, are these sort of darker images within it too. So there are lots of images in the regalia which make references to colonial battles, to um, military conquests. There are, there are coins, there are medals, there are chains. And in the centre of her headdress, the Queen wears an image of one of the ivory masks uh, looted during the British sacking of Benin City in the late 1890s. So you have all of these different kind of images with, um, with the, these sort of resonances of history, um, all tied up in, in this very exquisitely crafted, very beautiful, very, very resonant object. And one of the things that's really interesting for us as a museum with such a strong historic collection is the way in which pieces like this, which have a huge value in their own right as pieces of contemporary art, also set up interesting dialogues and conversations with the historic collections that we hold. So for example, because we have amazing collections of Victorian ceramics, including Parian ware, it's really interesting and powerful to be able to display a piece like this in the context of those 19th century collections. So I include this piece partly because it, it's such an exciting acquisition in its own right, but because also I think it helps to illustrate some of the ways in which we're continuing to think anew about our historic collections as well and thinking about how we can take new perspectives on those collections, spark new conversations and continually be looking in fresh ways at the collection that we have in the city. So I think I'm going to draw things to a close there. I hope I've given you a little bit of a snapshot through that very quick canter through the collection of 
um, just how rich the art collection in Birmingham is. And I hope you'll be encouraged to have a further look on Art UK at um, the collection in Birmingham, as well as uh, other collections too, and that you might like to come and visit Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery or one of our other sites uh, in the course of the rest of the year. So once again, thank you very much for joining today and thank you for listening. <laughs>